taking the time out and being here today. Uh, CCS Learning Academy is the professional training division of CCS Global Tech, a 24-year-old um, full-service IT consulting firm. Uh, we offer a wide range of innovative technology solutions and trainings for individuals, teams, and organizations. My name is Kajal Shalat and Director of Business Development, and I've been in the technology and professional training sector for the last 12 years. I'm going to add my LinkedIn and email address in the chat, so feel free to connect with me um, And now or in the future. So a little bit of housekeeping, we'll be running a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. So we have enabled the ask a question feature and it's on the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions, just pop them in there and then we'll get to that at the end as well. So if anything comes up, feel free to, to add the questions there. So today we have a well-respected data-driven defense evangelist who is a author and co-author of over 1,100 computer security columns and 12 books. So please welcome Roger Grimes, who is one of our partners at Nova 4. Hi, Roger. Hello, hello. Glad to be here. Can I take it away? Take it right away. Okay, thanks. Thanks everybody for showing on up. Let me get my slides. I'm moving. Again, about nuclear ransomware. If you haven't met me again before, I'm Roger Grimes. Just finished up my 13th book. And guess what it's on? It's on ransomware. It's on this topic. I just uh, finished up a book literally this week on uh, called Ransomware Protection Playbook that should be out uh, next month. On It's already for sale on Amazon, but should be actually published and out next month. I work for Nova 4. We're the world's largest integrated security awareness and simulated phishing platform vendor. So we help people not to get fished and trying to keep people from being fished will help you avoid ransomware. So what I wanna do is kind of give a really good overview about today's ransomware. It's usually more sophisticated than a lot of people know about and doing a lot more stuff. And so that's what I wanna cover is what it does, how it breaks in, how you can prevent it, which is the most important part. So uh, <clears throat> ransomware has actually been around since 1989, something called the, um, they call it the AIDS cop Trojan or something like that. But I remember uh, I actually was in this field way back when, and I remember that program, uh, many encrypted files and that sort of stuff. The guy actually that's, that uh, pushed out that 1989 program actually got arrested and tried in a couple of different courts. And then ransomware really didn't go anywhere for a long time. Uh, and it came back in little ebbs and flows, but really Bitcoin is what Bitcoin came out in 2009. Uh, ransomware started using it in 2013, and from there, it really exploded. Traditionally, what ransomware has always done is broken in somehow through social engineering, unpatched software, password guessing, or whatever. Um, maybe it, it grabs some more network passwords in order to spread more. Initially, it was actually focused on consumers, uh, and it just broke into a computer and immediately encrypted the computer and just said, hey, you need to pay me 300 bucks. It really wasn't that sophisticated. Uh, now, uh, or when they started to focus on organizations, they realized, hey, we need to lock up a whole bunch of computers. So the, the malware, the ransomware try to grab, in most cases, Windows network passwords off the current machine or passwords that are used on Windows services, use those network passwords to infect more computers, and then lock up a whole bunch of computers at once, uh, encrypt them, and then ask for a ransom extortion payment to provide the one or more decryption keys. That is what ransomware was, and that's what it did to about the end of 2019. And prior to the end of 2019, uh, a good backup alone could save you. You know, So if you had a really good tested backup and the bad guys hadn't corrupted that backup or deleted it or whatever, you could say, listen, we're not going to pay you your ransom. We're just going to restore the data from our backups. Have a good day. Well, starting about November, December of 2019, one of the ransomware groups got tired of people not paying because they had good backups. And they realized that really the hacker goal that they had was that they were inside of these people's environments on their computers, had their passwords. Many times they dumped every password that was in the environment, had complete control over all kinds of things. And they realized that encrypting data and holding it for hostage really was the least of what they could do. Uh, so this is what they started doing then. This is what most ransomware does now. Uh, the vast majority of it, 80, 85% of it does this. Uh, so not only does it encrypt the software but, or encrypt data, 
Before it does that, though, it steals. They actually spend time uh, looking around on your network. The ransomware gangs will look for your most valuable intellectual property and data. They'll learn what your company organization considers the crown jewels, steal and exfiltrate that information and customer lists and passwords. They still both employee and customer passwords. If you have a customer website, they still those passwords. If you have employees that are going to different websites every day, both personal and professional, they still those passwords. They will actually threaten your customers. They will threaten your employees, especially if you don't pay. They'll literally go to the, ever all your customers and all your employees and go, listen, we're only going to ask for money from you uh, because your employer or your vendor didn't pay. And we don't want to do this, but we got to do it. You know, isn't Roger such a terrible guy because he didn't pay the ransom and he's making us attack you. They also many times will use uh, infiltrated uh, computer systems at a victim to attack other trusted business partners. So they'll send spear phishing emails from somebody's compromised computer to a trusted business partner. So a lot of times traditionally, if you got phished, you tell somebody, well, if the fish, if the email comes from somebody you don't know or from an email address that you don't normally deal with, then be suspicious about it. But in these cases, they're actually breaking into the accounts payable, accounts receivable computers and the C-level employee computers and, and, and sending emails to other people saying, hey, I need you to change. We're going to change our banking. We're changing the banks that we uh, take payments to. And so I need you to send future payments to this and you know, make this change and pay this invoice. So, and those emails are coming from people that you've had a long time established relationship from the email address that you're used to receiving it from. Oftentimes uh, using a subject line that you all have used before in the past. So, so it just looks like it's a continuing thread. Uh, so it makes you more likely to fall victim and you one victim creates another victim that creates another victim. And then they'll publicly shame all the uh, victim organizations used to be a lot of the victims would try to hide and not tell the public, hey, we're down for a couple of days because the ransomware were these days you can't. The bad guys advertising it. They have even kind of their own, own little public relations PR teams and PR websites. And they say we broke into this person. And here's an example of the data we stole to prove that we're in there and we're asking for a ransom and they have five days to, to answer or else we're going to lock up everything. All together, these new five things, sometimes you hear it called, they'll call these things double extortion. It really is quintuple extortion. But the, the problem is, is that a, a backup alone is not going to save you, right? You need to have a good tested backup but there's a whole lot more going on that a backup is not going to save you. And really how it kind of works today is that uh, you, know, you get compromised by what's called a stub program um, that sometimes called a download or sometimes called a stub program. And a person gets compromised usually because of social engineering or unpatched software or password guessing or something like that. But either way, that stub file gets executed and then it installs itself on the computer system in such a way that it can live through a reboot or something like that, establish, establishes permanency. And then it dials home, or we call it dials home, but connects back to its command and control servers, the CNC servers or C squared servers. But those servers are just somebody else's computers that are compromised somewhere else. And those people are like, man, my Windows computer is so slow. Windows sucks. I can't believe how slow it is. But it's really because their computers are hosting these command and control servers and having all of these thousands to tens of thousands of ransomware bots connect back to them asking for the instructions. And the first thing that they'll usually do, well, actually, they'll usually, if they've captured any passwords, they upload those real quick so the hacker can get them. But most of the time, one of the first things they do is download a new copy of themselves. So the hackers actually monitor uh, Google's Virus Total website. If you haven't been to uh, virustotal.com, you should go there. It has 73 antivirus engines, and they keep track. Those antivirus engines, vi uh, Google Virus Total, keeps track of what antivirus engines out of the 73 or 75 or whatever the number is these days uh, that they're running there will we'll be able to detect this particular ransomware program. And if the hacker or the program detects that it's being detected by one or more antivirus engines, it re-encrypts itself so that it's undetectable. So as soon as it connects back, the first thing it does is say, hey, do I need to download a new copy of myself? And then typically it will download one or two other uh, completely unrelated ransomware programs so that if your antivirus program uh, detects the ransomware program that broken initially. There's two more hidden somewhere else now that have completely different signatures. Then they'll collect as many passwords as they can. 
Uh, they'll you know, do whatever they are programmed to do. They constantly dial home every five minutes, every 20 minutes to see if there's any new instructions. They'll notify the ransomware gang of the new intrusion. Actually, what usually happens is they notify the, the ransomware bots, notify the command and control servers. The hacker just logs into his admin console. It lists all the different places it's been broken into. The, the ransomware bots will list the internal domain name of what they've broken into, which usually has, you know, kind of leads into the company name. The hacker will determine who he's going to break to, into when they rank. They want to get the most money. They break into the biggest organizations first, but then they go down into smaller. And you have some ransomware organizations that concentrate on particular industries or particular size companies. And then you have some that concentrate just on mid-sized companies or small companies. But in either case, most of the time, the ransomware is not all the time, but most of the time, they're going to dwell from days to weeks to months to years on your environment, and you'll never detect it because they're constantly updating themselves. So the average dwell time is up to eight months, but I've seen many customers that where it was dwelling for over a year or years before it went off and encrypted the stuff. And the hackers come in, analyze the target, they start sniffing, eavesdropping on emails, they start listening into security logs, they start listening, they try to figure out what the crown jewels are, they kind of find out how much money, they actually download financial statements and if you have cyber insurance policies, they download that to see how much of the ransom's covered for. They'll learn who's in charge of what, they'll find out what the crown jewels are, they'll exfiltrate that data, they'll collect the passwords, so whatever they want, then they finally launch the encryption and ask for the ransom. This is what the majority of ransomware does today, is all of this stuff. So again, they're usually in your environment for a long time. They're researching your organization. They're stealing data and emails and passwords. Um, they're trying to figure out how to cause the victim organization the most operational pain, reputational pain, so they'll pay. Like, you know, they kind of see themselves as these business people. And they're like, listen, I don't want to hurt you. But if I got to hurt you to get paid, I'm going to hurt you, <laughs> you know, and the big thing is that the data exfiltration is a big threat because they say, hey, if you don't pay us, we're going to release this to the public or to your competitors or to other hackers. We're going to make your operational life, your employees life, your customer lives a living hell if you don't pay us. I even uh, knew of one where they actually found out the CEO was having an affair. They had evidence of those uh, emails and they told the CEO, if you don't pay us, we're going to release to your wife that you're having an affair. And the CEO paid quickly. <laughs> so uh, again, many times they exfiltrate the data, they'll copy it. It used to be megabytes, now it's gigabytes and gigabytes of it. Uh, even cybersecurity insurance policies, if they know that you have cybersecurity insurance, they'll see how much you, you get automatic, what's your maximum reimbursable amount for. Um, they'll target your database servers, your email servers, and then again, they'll threaten to post it publicly or give it to your competitors or to other black hat hackers, whatever it takes. The first time I noticed this was November 22nd, 2019, at least that it, that it happened. Before that, uh, some of these ransomware groups had threatened to do it. They even had taken the data sometimes and threatened, if you don't pay us, we're going to release the data, but they didn't release the data. But finally, uh, in 2000, November 22nd, 2019, they actually leaked the stolen data. That was the first time I was aware of it. And then it happened again with another attack from a different group. And then by, by January 2020, NIMPTY ransomware makers, and pretty soon there's about 100 ransomware groups. And over time, one by one, they started to see the other guy was being paid more often, even if the victim had a good backup. And so they all adopted it. So today, again, it's 80, 85% of all ransomware does what I just talked about. And they frequently copy the data and leak it. It's happened to large companies, small companies, you know, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, SpaceX. Uh, um, here's another one where they broke into uh, Lady Gaga, Madonna, and, and uh, Trump's lawyer and said, if you don't pay, it's $21 million. Or, and then it's interesting, many times the, the companies, like in this case, the lawyers that got hit, said, we're not paying you the $21 million. We have backups. And they're like, actually, we have all your client data, and now we won't double. That happens a whole lot where the original victim says, nope, we've got good backups. We're not paying you. And then they're like, well, we got your data. And let me say more people today pay because of the potential damage from the exfiltrated data than from the encrypted files. That happens all the time. And again, the, the ransomware guys are deleting these backups. Uh, a lot of people are like, oh, we have offline backups. And I go, well, can you get to your offline back, your offline backups uh, using an online console? And they're like, why, yes. I'm like, it's not offline. If you can get to it online, so can the hacker. 
Uh, so again, these threats to exfiltrate the data was over 70% of all ransomware attacks. That was last year. The new figure just came out for this year and it's 80 to 85% do this double extortion or what I call quintuple extortion now. Uh, here's an example where they were even auctioning off one of the, th this did not become popular, but it's kind of wild to me that they, they think they're on eBay or something like we have this company's data. Here are some examples of it, the database files, and we'll sell it to you. <laughs> you know, the blitz price, the, the quick price, you know, is $100,000 versus $50,000 or something like that. Um, uh, I don't think that auction uh, turned out to have a payer that we know of, but it's just kind of innovative about what they're doing. Again, they're going to steal every credential they can, both personal and professional. Uh, it used to be that, they, again, they used to distill credentials to try to, uh, to move laterally throughout the organization and encrypt more machines. But now they're just taking every type of password. And the first time, again, I heard this talked about, but was with Brian Krebs was talking about in January, uh, 2020, uh, January 6th in 2020. And what he covered was that this ransomware uh, gang had successfully attacked this company and the company and, and Brian reported on it and uh, and the ransomware hacker has been in the company for 14 months without detection. And that company, it's never good to be reported on by Brian Krebs usually, uh, but they, the company got rid of the ransomware hackers. So they thought, and they contacted Brian and said, hey, instead of writing this bad article, why don't you brag about how we got rid of the ransomware hackers in like a day or two? We really are an example of what, you know, what's right to do with getting rid of ransomware. Uh, what they didn't know is that the ransomware had used the TrickBot Trojan. TrickBot is a Trojan that's been stealing passwords. That's its main thing. It steals passwords all around networks. And that the hacker, the ransomware hackers actually stolen their uh, per personal and professional emails, not only their email passwords, but their direct deposit account login information, Medicaid billing portals, cloud based payroll management services, medical supplies, shipping post accounts and everybody's Amazon, Facebook, LinkedIn, Microsoft and Twitter accounts. So if you're at work and you're like, oh, I'm going to go to Amazon and buy some garbage bags. So they're waiting for me when I get home. They're stealing that stuff. And then again, saying to the employees and the customers uh, passwords is still, if, if, you know, if Roger doesn't pay, we're going to attack you and make your life a living hell. Uh, and so they th they're constantly threatening the employees of these locations. They're constantly uh, threatening the customers saying, hey, Roger didn't care enough to protect your data. And, uh, and, and now, you know, we have to, you know, we're going to ask you for the money. It's only because Roger. So they're literally causing uh, these, uh, you know, the, the companies, the victim organizations, reputational harm by their employees and customers, uh, you know, which is just wild to see, you know, letting them know, they let the customers know, we have your logins and private data, and we're going to release it publicly if you don't pay us. Uh, here's an example where the, they compromised uh, racetrack, the gasoline, you know, fill up station, and then they contacted uh, anyone that had provided an email address and contact information, credit card information, they contacted the, uh, you know, the so customers, buyers, partners, or employee racetrack and said, we have your information. And if you don't pay us, we're going to, you know, release your information. Right, here was another one. The first time I ever learned about this type of tactic, again, it was November of 20, uh, 2019. I think it was 2019. Um, it was where patients of a plastic surgery company got contacted uh, and said, so they broke into this plastic surgery center, which I think was in Florida, maybe it was California. Uh, but they said uh, that the plastic surgery center didn't pay. And so the uh, hackers went to the patients of those uh, of the plastic surgery center and said, hey, we have both your before and after photos. So imagine that you went there for, you know, usually your before photos when you go to a plastic surgery center ain't great. I wouldn't want anybody to have my after photos, but they're like, hey, if you don't pay us, we're going to release, you know, your before and after photos and the, I, the fact that you had a facelift or whatever, if you don't pay us. And I think they're asking for, $1,500, $2,500 of the different patients. So it wasn't a whole lot, but you can imagine the patients of this compromised plastic surgery center are probably less likely to go to that vendor afterwards. Probably the biggest one I saw uh, where they were threatening the patients was this one that happened in, I think it was in the Netherlands, uh, but a bunch of um, psychiatry centers, uh, there, it's a very, it was a very widespread public worth billions of dollars psychiatric center in the Netherlands they got broken into. They refused to pay. They're initially asked to pay 40 Bitcoin, that company, Vastamo, or however you would say that in Dutch. Uh, and so they actually, it started, they had the database of all these 
people and said, uh, we have your recorded conversations. A lot of these people didn't know that their conversations were being recorded and transcribed into the system to even be stolen. But the hacker was saying, if you don't pay us, and I think yeah, they're asking for, for three, 200 euros, 180 or 200 you know, uh, euros, and it were doubled after 24 hours and so on, they released that information. And they did release that information. That was not a, uh, an idle threat. And one of the guys said, listen, you know, was this, uh, he said, well, you know, I was a young kid, I was traumatized, and he said all these bad things about his mother, but over the years, he'd repaired his relationship with his parents, and he didn't want this, you know, all the stuff he complained about to be out there. And they did release it out there to the public. So it's uh, kind of wild. 300 records had already been published on the dark web. So kind of wild. And again, they're using this stolen data and systems to spearfish other people, other trusted partners are looking, uh, you know, to see uh, what's being talked about. They're, they're connecting and finding out where the accounts receivable and accounts payable people are and payroll people and using their systems to spearfish other people. They actually insert email rules so that if the other person comes back and says, are you sure you want me to update banking details? That email is intercepted. So the compromised victim doesn't even know that it's there and they delete it from the inbox and from the deleted items. And then they respond to them. Yes, yes. You know, we hate our bank. They're charging too much interest or fees. And so we're switching to this new bank. Um, so very, very common. So, and they're injecting themselves in the middle of existing threads and saying it's in those cases, it's kind of weird sometimes where someone will get an email from their partner going, hey, look at this document I found on this project we were looking at. And the person's like, wow, this is weird. This document had nothing to do with that project. And they don't even really know why that person sent it. But really what they've done is launch malware into their environment. Um, they, they publicly shamed the victims now again. They, they said, we're going to reveal all your stuff to the, to the internet or to people. Uh, initially, when this started happening, again, back in 2019, end of 2019, I was actually, I was working for uh, InfoWorld and CSO Magazines as a weekly security columnist, and they had contacted us of uh, the Maze Ransomware Group several times to see if we would publicize these big companies they had broken into and how much money they were asking for. And I remember meeting with our, my editor, Eric Knorr, at the time, and we decided, no, we're not going to be this unofficial PR arm of these agencies, or of these uh, ransomware people. So they actually opened up their own websites. And initially they're on the dark web and you need a tour to get to it, but now they actually have LinkedIn pages and public websites and stuff like that. Where again, they're like, we broke into this company this date and here's that you can click here and take an example and look at the files. And they have other people, you know, that are re, you know, now reposting this information. It's so like in this case, uh, some legitimate uh, white hat security researchers like, hey, our evil just dumped the files of American fashion house, Kenneth Cole, which by the way, I know that I'm not that fashionable because if I saw Kenneth Cole, I would have thought that was a person, not a fashion house. Uh, but you know, this person is republicizing that this Kenneth Cole got broken into. And then later on, the hackers actually published, hey, Kenneth Cole Productions, good guys who value their reputation and their customers, be like Kenneth Cole and take care of your nerves and the money. You know, essentially saying, yes, we've, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they paid the ransom. And then here's an example of the some of the major ransomware groups. And they're, these are most of these are on the dark web, uh, but they have public websites as well uh, that you can go to. Uh, and then even like, here's an interesting one. Um, I didn't work this one, but I, I knew of this one. This was a yacht broker. I'm into boats. And I remember a, a yacht broker friend of mine said, hey, did you hear about Denison? Uh, Denison yacht sales, they get hit by ransomware. And what the ransomware did is still exfiltrated the data and customer passwords and all that sort of stuff. And then they took over Denison's website. Uh, so it was at denisonyachtsales.com and they left this message and they actually made a, they actually registered a new website called denisonextortion.com just for this break-in. And they opened up an email account just using Denison Extortion just for this. And they left this so they left this message on the real denisonyachtsales.com main webpage. It said, because Robert Dennison failed to take very simple security measures on his devices, I hacked and all employee Google accounts that were hosted on the domain name of denisonyachtsales.com. All company leads, accounting archives, employee social security numbers, employee signatures, including data sent from the clients of Denison Yacht to the million accounts of the company are under my control. If you've ever conducted business with Bob Denison, your private, your private data might be in my hands right now. What do I want? I want Bob to send me 15 Bitcoin. I think back then when this happened, 15 Bitcoin wasn't worth a lot. It's worth a lot more today. What will happen if my demand's not fulfilled when the countdown finishes here? When I first saw the countdown, it was around five days. 
Uh, but by the time I decided to take a picture of it, it was down to the last day. When the countdown here finishes, all data that was mentioned previously will be publicly available for anyone who visits this webpage. So again, they opened up a new website. Uh, Bob, this is your fault. Don't make other people pay for your fault. If there's any questions, reach me at Dennis and Extortion at ProtonMail.com. ProtonMail.com is a public email service that does encrypted email. And it's supposed to be anonymizing. Uh, very difficult to find out who is the originating person of that email. Uh, and if this website shuts down, because remember, they were hosting this on the real DennisandYachtSales.com. But knowing that Dennis and Yacht Sales was going to shut that down, they you know opened up a new uh, the website of this Dennis and extortion.com. And I don't know if uh, Bob Dennison ever paid this ransom or not, but this is, you know, pretty demoralizing for everybody involved. Uh, and this again is very, very common today. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'd even caution you um, some people, these web pages are set up, but the countdown doesn't count to the first person connects. So if you find, if you know, if there's some page they're sending you to, if you get a ransomware notice on your screen, they're like, click here to see your message. Be careful about clicking there because that may start the countdown counter. Those web pages are typically uh, very specialized just for you. And if you don't go to the web page, the counter doesn't start. So avoid starting the counter. <laughs> so how does ransomware break in? Well, really all hackers and malware, this is the one of nine or 10 ways, 10 ways that any ransomware or hacker breaks into your environment. I've been keeping track of this list for my whole career. Um, you know, it can be because of a programming bug. That would usually be some software exploit. Usually it's been patched and someone's just not applied the patch or it could be because of a zero day social engineering, very popular way for them to break in, right? Get someone to run some Trojan software, provide some credentials. Could be an authentication attack like password guessing or a man in the middle attack or something like that. Human error. Some people, you know, uh, accidentally do something they didn't mean to do. It could, could be because of a misconfiguration. Uh, maybe something was set insecurely, like maybe someone had everyone full control of files that were on a store on a hard drive or an uh, Amazon AWS storage bucket. Could be eavesdropping or man and middle attack, maybe sent by email and social engineering involved, and now they can see what everybody's sending and the passwords and stuff. Could be data malformation. That would be like a buffer overflow. Could be network traffic malformation. That would be like a denial of service attack. Could be an insider attack, even with ransomware. Many times ransomware pay uh, disgruntled employees to place ransomware in environments. It happens all the time. Tesla, uh, they were offering a Tesla employee a million dollars to place ransomware, but he turned the ransomware gang in and they actually captured and arrested a couple of Russians. But uh, it happens. It happens time to time. Uh, I don't know if any insider has ever been caught doing it, but I have to assume that it does work because they many times are offering 50, 100,000, a million dollars. There's got to be some employees that take that deal. There could be a third party reliance issue where they're uh, relying upon the, uh, uh, you know, where, you know, your customer or partner or whatever gets compromised and they use that to compromise you. Or it could be some sort of physical attack. I think maybe they're using USB keys, they drop out in the hard drive or drop out in the uh, parking lot or they steal your hard drive or cell phone or whatever. But these are the 10 ways that anything can break in. Although not all threats are alike. There's certain things that are used far more often by hackers and malware. And the majority of all malicious digital breaches are due to social engineering and phishing. Social engineering is responsible for 70 to 90% of all successful malicious data breaches. Unpatched software is responsible for around 20 to 40%. And then password guessing and things like that are responsible for some point. As a matter of fact, everything else besides social engineering and unpatched software, typically across the board is less than 10% of the risk. So if you want to fight ransomware and hackers and malware, you should concentrate your efforts on fighting social engineering and unpatched software and probably password policies. If we look at just ransomware in particular, so that was for all hackers and malware completely. But if we're looking at all ransomware, just ransomware attacks, which are pretty popular and scary these days, I downloaded the list. I looked at over hundred ransomware reports and surveys and only found six that actually listed percentages of the root causes. But if you look, social engineering is the, the by far the number one cause of uh, all, uh, you know, of most of the reported phishing of uh, most of the reported ransomware root cause threats. Although Coveware had one where RDP was up higher for a quarter. But most of them, it's, you know, most of them say that it's social engineering, unpatched software, and then RDP, that's Microsoft's remote desktop protocol. Typically what they're doing there is they already have your password. They bought somebody's successful, legitimate password, and they're just breaking in using that password. Or it could be that they're doing password guessing against 
against it if you don't have account lockout enabled or something like that. But those are the these are the causes of ransomware attacks. Number one, social engineering. Number two might be RDP or password guessing. Unpatched software is in here, you know, and there's some other things in here like USB keys and things like that. So how can you prevent it? Well, the first thing to remember, and this needs to be communicated to whoever is involved in protecting you uh, or, or responding to a ransomware attack, is just know that you know a backup alone will not save you. I don't think I ever read a ransomware prevention report that doesn't mention backup being your primary defense. And that's all right, because you do need to have a good secure backup, but that's not really prevention. That's really recovery after you've been attacked. What, you know, what I like to tell people is that even if you have that great backup, because they're doing the quintuple extortion things, it, it's not, most people are still ending up paying uh, even if they have a really good backup. So the other thing to realize is that ransomware is not your real problem. Ransomware is the outcome of your real problem. How ransomware got in is your real problem. So social engineering was an unpatched software is a trusted insider. How did the ransomware got to get in? Because if you don't close the root cause threats that are allowing bad things to get into your environment, you're never going to stop bad things from getting into your environment. Or what I like to tell people, suppose I was able to wave a wand and all ransomware went away today. There was ransomware before and now no more ransomware. If you still allow unpatched software and social engineering and password problems uh, to, info, you know, to, to be spread in your environment, it's just going to be some other type of attack. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be a hacker coming in and or a remote backdoor Trojan or pass the hash attacks, or whatever. Ransomware is not your real problem. Ransomware is the outcome of your real problem. And you have to focus on how, excuse me, the ransomware got in, how the ransomware got admin or domain admin or root on your systems and close those holes. And once you close the root cause exploit methods of how this stuff gets into your environment, it stops all this stuff. If you stop social engineering and do better at patching your software, you not only don't have to worry about ransomware as much, but all the other threats like you know business email compromise and password recording trojans and you know pass the hash attacks and all this other stuff. If you close the methods, the root cause exploits that allow badness to get into your environment, you're going to have less problems overall. But if you were to tell me what's the five things, what's the five things you would pick, Roger, for stopping all hackers and, and ransomware attacks and that sort of stuff? First of all, you do have to have a great tested backup. And by that, I mean is that it needs to be offline. It needs to be the three, two, one uh, type thing that you see. Um, let me write this, make a note here. So I'm going to put three, two, one in the slide for now on. But you want to have good tested offline backups, so offline so the hackers, the ransomware groups can't get to your backup. It needs to be three, two, one. You have three back copies of your data. Typically it's the original copy plus two backups. The two backups should be in different places and different media types, one of which should be stored truly offline, meaning that if you can, if you can get to your backup in an online method way, then it's not offline. It should require some physical thing to happen before that third backup or the second backup, however you look at it, uh, gets restored or gets put back in the system to get restored. If, again, if you can get to the backup, so can the attacker. It needs to be tested. It needs to be reliable. It needs to be complete. I know of lots of companies that had good, reliable, tested, safe backups that still got compromised are still paid, I'm sorry, still paid the ransom because when they started doing the backup restoration, they found it was going to take them a thousand years. Like you're like, oh yeah, we got good tested backups and you restore one server and it takes all day. And you're like, wow, how many servers do you have to recover from? Oh, 80 or 800. Uh, so I know lots of people went, you know what? I didn't realize how long it was going to take to restore. And so we're going to pay the ransom just because it's quicker to decrypt the files than it is to restore the files. But that's all, again, for recovery. I'm a big believer in focusing on prevention. So you want to focus on mitigating social engineering every single way that you can. And we'll talk more about that. You want to patch your internet accessible software 100%. So, you know, that's your browsers, that's your browser add-ins, that's your operating system, that's your VPN software and all that sort of stuff needs to be patched. I know a lot of people, especially during COVID, that went to new VPNs, like use VPNs because that makes you safe but then they didn't aggressively patch the VPN software. Lots of ransomware has broken in using the VPN software 
uh, that the defenders put in to defend against the ransomware because the defenders then didn't aggressively patch the VPN software. You know, everything you add to your environment becomes an additional point of potential attack. And if you don't follow the due diligence and patch well, that becomes a hole they can use. You want to use MFA where you can, where you can't use multi-factor authentication. You want to use non-guessable passwords, and they should be unique, hard to guess, and different for every unrelated website and service. So that's like the number three way that hackers and malware and ransomware breaks in is these guessable passwords or stolen passwords. So again, you wanna use non-shared, you wanna have unique passwords for every website and service. They should be long and complex enough, not easy to guess. You wanna enable account lockout and uh, log on portals. And really, if you don't have to use passwords, if you can use MFA, you should use MFA. So use MFA where you can, use strong passwords for every website and service. Make sure you enable account lockout on every login portal so that a password guesser can't just guess a million billion times, including your application programming interfaces. Um, not every company has application programming interfaces, but many companies do. And these are these little systems and services and databases that are accessible from the internet like no before has one. And it allows people and systems to connect to it and do queries and do different things. But if you, uh, I think Acme, Acme recorded last year, they recorded 61 billion password guessing attempts in over a year and a half, over 18 months. 80% of those were against API portals, not regular user login portals. And the reason why is that most people don't enable account lockout on their APIs. Most people don't monitor their APIs for failed logins and that sort of stuff. So make sure that you're enabling account lockout everywhere, even on your APIs. Also a big believer in to teach yourself and your users and friends and family and coworkers how to spot rogue URLs, most phishing attempts, which are the number one cause of uh, ransomware and other things are caused by these bogus URLs. They claim they're from Facebook or Microsoft or Twitter or whatever it happens to be, uh, or from your boss. And they're like, click here to download this thing. But if you were to hover over that link, it, it doesn't point to where you think it's going to go. And so I actually created a webinar. It's one hour long there. You go to that, that bottom URL, their rogue URLs, and that'll take you to a one hour webinar that I have on how to spot rogue URLs. Or you can just read my article. I wrote an article on it for the top, the top 12 most common rogue URL tricks. Let me say, I write about this topic all the time. I've written a couple of articles about it just recently up on our Know Before blog. Uh, if you want to know everything in my brain and Know Before's collective brain of how to keep to fight phishing, I have a webinar for that and an ebook. So I created a one hour webinar. I think it's got 99 slides. This is here. This is how you stop phishing. And then uh, I also, if you don't like one hour webinars, sometimes I don't, and I don't even like to listen to my, myself talk for an hour. I created an ebook. I think the ebook's 40 or 50 pages long, but it has everything that's in the webinar and more to tell you every single thing, every policy, every technical defense, and every uh, best practice, social, social awareness training thing you should do to prevent ransomware and social engineering attacks, phishing and all that stuff. You can also download this Red Flags training PDF folder. If you go to this link at the bottom, it's an article I wrote, but you can also download this social engineering Red Flags PDF poster. You can print it, share it, give it to anyone, but it contains 22 of the most common signs of what a social engineering email looks like. So it talks about you're getting, you know, if you get an email that arrives at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, if, you, if it has a subject, a weird subject or misspelled text or the, you know, if the sender address is different than the reply to address or the sender friendly email address is different than the actual email address or there's ty weird typos in it or it has potentially dangerous file attachments or it was unexpected and that sort of stuff. So it lists the 22 red flag signs that this email may be a phishing attempt or not. You can download the article, you can download the PDF, you can email me. If you email me at rogerg at noble4.com, I'll send you this PDF poster and another one that I'll show you in just a second. But this is a good one to learn, to print, to share. I also created the 12 red flags of rogue URLs that talks about here's the 12 different types of tricks that 
that spammers and, and hackers and ransomware people try to do to get you to trick you into clicking on uh, you know, a, a rogue domain, like in that second or third, that second example, it looks like linkedin.com, but it isn't. It's actually two L's, LLLinkedin.com. The third one there looks like it might be Microsoft, but it's not Microsoft.com. It's, uh, you know, it's really going to update.decemberinfo.com and so on, or Google Chrome updates is not a Google website. That, can, that was a really uh, phishing URL I got one day. Or bank, it claims like it's from Bank of America, but it's not from Bank of America. It really is from customerloyaltyaccounts.com, which could be anybody and so on and so on. So if you go to this link there, that's an article I wrote and you can download this PDF and send, print it, share it, read it, learn it, or email me at rogerg at noblecore.com and I'll send you both PDF posters. Lots of other defenses you could do, these regular defense in depth things uh, that every all of us should do, you know, to patch and make sure you don't have too many people in your administrator account. Don't be logged in as administrator all the time to pick up emails. Make sure you have tested restores of your backup so you know how long it's going to take and, and so on and so on and so on. Encrypt your data and get cybersecurity insurance and that sort of stuff. There's all kinds of defenses of things you can do uh, that go beyond just the first five. But the, the, for my money, the first five that I covered here, let me go back to them one more time. I'm kind of going backwards here. Uh, here we go. Make sure you have a good backup. Focus on mitigating social engineering. Patch your internet accessible software. Uh, again, the most likely attack stuff, that's browsers, internet add-ins, operating systems, things like that. Make sure you use MFA where you can. Where you can't use MFA, use a non-guessable password that you change at least once a year. Make sure it's strong and unguessable and not shared. And teach yourself and, uh, and your friends and family and users how to spot rogue URLs. Those five things, if you do those well, you don't have to worry nearly as much about hackers or malware. And if you don't do those five things well, you have to do everything else and everything else will not work as well as what I talked about doing. Also make sure if you're in charge of your company's you know, ransomware response plan or hackers and malware, you need to communicate with management, let them know that a backup alone will not save you from ransomware. And think about if you do get hit by ransomware, I think the uh, the low they most surveys say that the uh, over 50 percent of companies got hit by ransomware last year and this year some of them are saying it's going to be close to 100 percent so there's a good chance you could be hit by ransomware you want to talk to management talk about are you going to pay the ransom not pay the ransom what type of communications you're going to have now with customers employees if their information gets stolen and so on and so on proactively talk about this so that when you're hit by a ransomware attack you're not kind of responding in a panicked way also, of course, I know before we believe in training, we believe every employee should get a longer training when they're hired for like, you know, 15, 30, 45 minutes uh, when they're hired. Same thing again, every year thereafter, thereafter, they get shorter training, maybe like one to three minute videos or those PDF files I talked about. And then you give them monthly simulated phishing attacks to see if they can be phished and people that fell, <coughs> excuse me, the phishing attacks should then get more education. And we know for sure that our customers that do what I just said, which is training, including monthly training, followed by monthly simulated phishing, will decrease the amount of employees that will click on a phishing attempt from over 30% to below 5% in less than a year. And remember, since the vast majority of breaches are because of social engineering, this is the best thing you can do to reduce cybersecurity risk in your environment. Uh, I'm getting ready to take some questions. If you don't get your question answered today, feel free to email me at rogerg at knowbefore.com. You can contact me on, of course, Twitter and LinkedIn. And of course, you can contact CCS Learning Academy and CCS Global Tech and get your uh, questions answered there as well. And with that said, I know I've said a lot in the, the last 43 minutes or so, but I hope, I, I hope you all have asked some questions that I can answer. Let's see, I'll take a look in the chat or the question and answers. No open questions there. Let me go to the chats. Maybe everything was, no questions, anybody? There was a question, Roger. Uh, we will be sending the recording to all registered attendees for this webinar. So you will get the recording of this. Just wanted to okay. let everybody know that. Okay, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to send them to CCS Global Tech or to me at rogergnoblefore.com. And, you know, thanks for putting up with me and, and good luck fighting the good fight against hackers and malware and all those criminal, terrible ransomware people. Um, oh, we do have a question. Roger. Yeah, I see, I, I see that. Uh, any social media where you can follow me? Yes, 
I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, Clubhouse. I'm everywhere. Uh, but if you put in Roger A. Grimes, if you put in Roger Grimes, sometimes you get the Canadian Prime Minister of the Labour Party in Newfoundland. So if you put in Roger A. Grimes, you'll get me. So if you put in Roger A. Grimes on LinkedIn, that's probably my main place that I hang out is LinkedIn.com and Twitter. And I, I post uh, one to two to three articles that I write every single week and stories and white papers. And I republish a lot of other stuff. And you can also, if you go to the Know Before blog, if you go to knowbefore.com uh, and, and go to the blog thing, I write several articles there every week as well. Perfect. I don't think we have any other questions. So thanks everybody. And when it comes to upskilling and reskilling, uh, CCS Learning Academy and CCS Global Tech is designed to be your secret um, weapon, your organization's secret weapon. So our subject matter experts like Roger are ready and waiting to work directly with you, your team, or your entire company. And we offer a wide range of courses and solutions um, so if you'd like more information, please reach out and contact me directly or Roger directly, and we'll be sending out the recording very shortly. So on behalf of CCS Learning Academy and Roger, we thank you for your attention to this important training and hope you learned some helpful tips and tricks on how to prevent ransomware. Stay safe. Thanks. Take care, everyone.